We're going to go now to Marianne Walsh and Richard Carter's garden in Oakland. This garden was designed by Lois Simons. It was installed by her company, Gardening with Nature's Design. And Lois's passions and expertise are in taking a permaculture approach to California hillside erosion, retaining rainwater on site, creating wetlands and dry creek beds, and in native plant selection. Marianna Richard have attended the tour since its inception in 2005. And over the years, they found not only inspiration, but also Lois, who really worked her magic for them. This is a beautiful garden. I really love this garden. The dry creek bed is not only attractive, but it also captures rainwater and retains it in a small wetland. You can see that there on the left. Retaining rainwater on site is important because it keeps your garden green longer. And as water slowly trickles into the soil, it helps to replenish the groundwater and protects the local creek from scouring. This garden has a beautiful parking strip. I don't have a photo up, I'm sorry, but if you have a parking strip to convert, you should not miss this one. On the green home front, Marianne and Richard have 30 solar panels on their roof, which generate all the energy they use in their house and it also powers their two electric cars. The Walshes have basically no PG&E bill, and of course, they pay nothing for gasoline or oil changes. So let us say hello now to um, Richard and Marianne and um, Lois. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, welcome. Shall we just launch into the video and then maybe we'll stop after the first video and take some questions and then we'll watch the second video and take some questions. Does that sound good to you? Sure, sounds good. Hello, my name is Lois Simons, and I'm the owner of Gardening by Nature's Design. This garden here in the Lakeshore District is Marianne and Richard's garden. And I came to this garden, there were already some elements here. I'm going to talk today about design and hopefully about the inflammation, some practical aspects of the inflammation of a design. When I came to this garden, there were already some boulders, but they were scattered throughout the garden and they had no relationship to one another. There was a dry creek bed, but you couldn't see it. This was the challenge that was posed to me. How could I connect these boulders and bring to everyone's attention the dry creek bed? I'd like to point out to you how I rearranged the stones that were already here and so that there's fluidity and continuity in the garden between the boulders, the stones, and also how it introduces you to the garden. So it naturally allows your eye to flow from one stone to the other, bringing you to the beautiful boulder and the entrance to the pathway. So it's bringing you to the boulder and into the garden, to the maple and the plants surrounding the maple, as well as bringing your eye to the beginning and starting of a path. Then you follow these stones and you follow it this way, you're brought to this extraordinary boulder. What happens here is you're brought to the lines of this boulder. Before, when I saw this boulder, it was extraordinary, but it was static. And now, because of how you're introduced to the boulder, you see the curves and the lines of the boulder. And they draw you into what I had proposed, which is, let's put in a wetlands. And the wetlands will connect this boulder to the dry creek bed that is behind it. And I will raise the dry creek bed, which was very shallow. There are only like one, two courses of stone. And I will build it up so that you can notice that there is indeed a dry creek bed. And that there's a relationship now between this beautiful boulder through the wetlands to the dry creek bed. 
I just want to point out how landscape can meet architecture. We have here, entering the house, these extraordinarily beautiful cut uh, stone entering the house. What an incredible entrance. And then we have the stone in the garden. Do you see how it complements the steps going up into the house so that there's a, an ambience between the two? And it retains its natural look, and yet it complements and works with the architecture that leads us into the house. We enter the garden path. And once again, the stone leads our way into the garden path and into the garden, so that the path itself is indeed a garden path, not separate from the garden because the stone will bring us to the path and into the beautiful maple bed. We wanted to keep the beautiful curve of the path, so we accentuated it with stones along the path. And we built up the entrance to the Dry Creek bed. So it has a presence, and it says, we're, I'm here, I'm in Dry Creek bed, enter me. And you can see they have a sitting area here so that they can sit from here and enter the dry creek bed as they're resting, relaxing in their garden. Bringing you into this dry creek bed, you can see that the stone is creating different vignettes and openings, windows, into the garden. Here we have the maple bed is introduced to us, and now the dry creek bed with the wetlands and its plants are introduced to us in this garden. And see how coherent it is. It falls and flows naturally. There's a fluidity and a continuity. And one feature um, enhances the other feature. You see how the wetland enhances the dry creek bed. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the plants. There were already some plants in this garden, but they were not faring. Well, the first step we took is we did a soil test and a filtration test. And what we discovered was that there were certain um, nutrients that were lacking in the soil, and that the soil itself was a sandy loam about 12 inches down, and then it turned to a, a clay soil. So this informed us in terms of what kind of irrigation, our approach to the irrigation, and, uh, and of course in bringing amendments to, to the soil. So we're not just placing plants in soil, there's a relationship. Everything is vibrant and alive and we recognize that and we work with that. So that the plants that were yellow and rather small um, are now flourishing. And, and green, and I will show you certain examples of how incredibly well things are flourishing in green. Of course, we worked with the Deodor cedar that's here in the garden, the two maple trees, the spruce, and there were a couple of Arctostaphylus, that's the manzanita, but the ground cover, there were a few, two here and there were the manzanator shrubs, the Howard McMinns, along the Dry Creek bed. And they wanted to expose the bark in this Howard McMinn along the creek bed. These shrubs will be further pruned. We wanted them to uh, come back into full health before pruning them. So they're a bit dense on the top, and in the fall we will, after they have had their berries, dropped and stuff, we will then go ahead and do a, a pruning. There was juniper here, we just kept that. And what we did is we worked with the Arctostaphylus or Manzanita emerald carpet. We put in another one to, to create a pattern. And we put several in the backdrop there to connect the area around the maple to the front of the garden. And we put a um, a point rays Arctostaphylus in the back there that will also flow down the hillside and has a nice deep green color. To act as a counterpoint, we put in the coyote bush pigeon point, Baccarus pillularis. And uh, 
so it has a different texture and it's a lighter green. And we also put in a different Arthostaphylis. This Arthostaphylis or Manzanita Pacific Mist. It's a wonderful uh, Manzanita to put by water features because as it grows, it will come down and it will arch. So unlike the emerald carpet that stays close and mounds uh, and stays close to the slope, this Pacific Mist will accentuate the slope and have the kind of fluidity that you would see in a, uh, in, with water and water features, mimicking that. And it also has a lighter color, so uh, it's a nice contrast. So I, what I want to say is, is that we don't simply plant a plant. Oh, I like this plant, I'll put it in the garden. What we plant is community of plants that have a relationship with one another. And just like the stone, how we change the stonework so that there's a continuity and the eye just naturally flows from one stone element to the other, so too there's a pattern so that your eye flows from one plant to the other. And it, it actually sees those plants, but it also sees the relationship between plants. And what you have is a coherent whole. And what you have is you're creating in both of these uh, ways of a sense of place, a place where you can be and rest. And it creates a sense of calm and peace. And that's what we like to create in our gardens. Then what we did, we used plants. Remember how I connected the boulder to the dry creek bed with the wetlands and raised the dry creek bed. And then we placed two grasses behind the dry creek bed. And behind that are some more plants, notably the Ceanothus dark star. And that Ceanothus dark star, very architectural in its growth, much like the Diodor cedar. So it's going to mirror the Diodor cedar and it's going to come up to five, six feet. So it's going to bridge the garden to the Diodor cedar and to the shrub Arctostaphylis, Howard McMinns. And so it's going to arch and it has this beautiful, rich, lilac, deep purple flower in the springtime. So what we're doing, we're extending the garden back, we're giving it perspective and depth. All of a sudden, instead of it being the focus of one thing, it's the focus of a whole array of things that are connected. So here we are in the sitting area in this garden. And what we did, and this is one of the permaculture principles, is to utilize the materials that are here on this property. So when we dug out the wetlands, we used that soil to build a nice hill here. And what that does is it creates an intimate space here. It embraces the sitting area. It's no longer has the sense of being just flat and out in the open. Instead, it's a nice resting area that's protected and has a sense of privacy. It also is placed so that you can really appreciate the dry creek bed and its entry, as well as the rest of the garden. This hill that we created has a number of features. We have uh, the Yerba Buena coursing through the garden, interspersed with hookara, the coral bells. And um, in the center of the bed, we have a mountain mahogany. It's a beautiful, beautiful plant. So it's used to being browsed by deer. Um, so it can be as little as three feet in maturity or 15 feet tall. There are deer in this garden. Every, every night, there are deer that are in this garden. So that's been a challenge. In order to protect the plants that the deer like to browse, is we've actually placed stakes around the plants initially for them to have the opportunity to root and settle in. 
Otherwise, the deer would just simply browse on them and actually pull them out of the ground. So that's one thing we've had to do. In certain areas, we put bird netting over just to allow the entire area to establish. As you can see, it's doing very well, and it does well with being browsed, so we're going to allow that to happen. Also in the background here, I mentioned before that we found the nutrients in the soil to be lacking. This is an evergreen currant, which is a, a, a ribes, and what it is, it's a berry plant. And it's one of the few berry plants native to California that retains its leaves all year long. This uh, evergreen currant was um, pretty meager and yellow. Not doing well at all. As you can see, it is flourishing right now and totally green. So, so this is how we approach gardens. We approach it literally from the ground up. Um, over here is uh, another berry plant, a native California native currant. It is the Ribes sanguinium claremont, and. Uh, as you can see, it's doing beautifully. Right now, it's kind of enmeshed in the evergreen current, but it will actually grow to be about eight, 10 feet tall. And we're going to semi um, spoliate it so that it will go on the wall of this house and be a wonderful backdrop, a natural backdrop for the garden. So, the structure and the garden are meeting, but in a very friendly fashion. Um, over here, surrounding, surrounding, backing the sitting area is the California huckleberry. And it will actually have huckleberries. It loves uh, living in the shade and stuff. And uh, they're like a very small blueberry, very intense. Uh, when I've been up at Sea Ranch collecting the huckleberries, five feet, ten feet away are deer also collecting the huckleberries. So the deer will be very happy with this garden. Instead of creating a barrier to the deer, we're creating a home and working with them as best we can. So in this area here, as, as I spoke about, we have the Ceanothus dark star, which will come architecturally up to six feet and spread out. And then we have behind it the Howard McMinn uh, Arctis daffodilus. And here, unlike over by the creek bed, we're going to allow this to be a shrub. It's one of the few manzanitas that as it grows, it actually can retain all of its leaves lower down and uh, if it's properly maintained. And so it will form just a little backdrop here. I just want to point out to you that the depth of this perspective, it just draws you in. You're totally in this wild landscape now. Very natural wild landscape. And it just draws you in. So we're shifting perspective, and that's part of design, is shifting your perspective and adding some depth and a quality so that you're entering into different spaces, but naturally. So I just want to point out to you, that, um, and to me that feels really important, especially in California, where we have a tendency to drought and we're in currently in a very severe drought, uh, to bring water features, natural water features into the garden. Oftentimes, when it's possible, I will actually take the water from the roof of the house and bring it into a wetlands in a dry creek bed. But even so, if I'm simply even capturing water in these dry creek beds and the wetlands, what it does, if the soil is viable, it actually raises the water table. And what that does is that it allows the plants, once they've established, to draw from that table for a longer period of time so that we are less dependent on irrigation to keep these plants alive and flourishing.
me say before um, before I go on to questions that that is such a beautiful garden. I just love this garden when I saw it. Lois is a longtime uh, friend and uh, nearby neighbor. And you can see more of Lois's work if you go to the Bringing Back the Native Garden Tour. Um, find a designer and look under Lois Simons, Gardening by Nature's Design. You'll see a portfolio of the gardens that she has designed and you can look at other gardens that she has put uh, uh, what rainwater retention in and beautiful stonework. And something that just struck me about your presentation, Lois, was your emphasis on thoughtful design. It's such a beautiful garden, but it's obviously so clearly well thought out in a way that I don't normally think about as someone who admires gardens, but I don't think about the thought that went in to creating them that way. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure, and I appreciate your um, introduction. That's really um, beautiful. Um, so yeah, it's an organic process. So this design evolves as I'm on site and it evolves in discussion with my clients. And um, um, Richard and Marianne have been just really uh, rich components of the uh, uh, development of this garden. And um, they had the, the bare bones, they had the makings of it, and it was just um, meant for me to bring it together. And uh, so it's it's really interesting that you can have the elements and yet it does not create the uh, um, continuity and coherence that you want in a garden so that you're you're basically a lot of design is about training where the eye goes. And through your eye, you enter the garden. And so you have to create um, continuity and a sense of connection, both in the plants in, in terms of color and texture and also in the stones. So uh, that's what I look for. And uh, if you come to the garden, you'll see that there are many rooms, so to speak, or vantage points in which to enter into the garden and experience it in a slightly different way. And so um, the other thing that wasn't uh, somehow missed in this video was um, <clears throat> to the uh, right side of the entryway, we built a stone wall. And we continued the continuity with the other side of the garden. So it would have the same architectural weight. And uh, we used the river rock. And because it was river rock, we made it very fluid and flowing instead of uh, architectural and just straight and linear. And we also used these stones, which had this shape to them, almost like dolphins leaping. And we put these stones on top of one another like that. Um, so a lot of the impact of the garden is actually, it's felt um, not just through the eye, but through the body, your own body, you feel it. Um, and so um, it, it creates within yourself a sense of place and peace. And that's what we look for. Well, you did it. I know I saw this garden. I see them all really, and it was beautiful. I have a question. Well, there are a number of questions in the chat for both Lois, the designer, and also Marianne and Richard, the homeowners. And it's about the rainwater retention. So Lois, maybe you can talk about the flow, like where does the water come from and where does it go to and what happens if the rainwater system overflows. And Marianne and Richard, since you're there on a daily basis, can you let us know how did it work during the big rains this year? So we'll start with you, Lois. Uh, so um, in this garden, oftentimes, um, if it's possible, I will redirect the water from the roof of a house into the garden. But uh, that water had already been um, um, redirected. So we're just really using the natural elements of the wetlands to capture water, as well as the dry creek bed. And this garden can really absorb rainwater well because of the 10 inches of light sandy loam soil before it gets into the uh, <clears throat> the clay soil. The thing we have to be careful about is once the soil reaches saturation, um, whether through irrigation or through the rains, that we don't continue to irrigate and we draw back. So we both have to apply good irrigation for the sandy loam top of the soil and then um, 
bring um, pulled back the irrigation for the clay soil underneath. And it's kind of a little bit of a dance. Thank you. So Mary and Richard, can you tell us, so we had a lot of rains this winter. How did the, the wetland go? How did the water flow grow and so on? Well, we didn't drown. <laughs> No, so as Lois said, most of the water was already, the water from the roof of the house had already been redirected years ago um, into buried pipes. So all of that, we didn't have to worry about all of that roof water. Um, and the water in the, there was never any standing water in the, um, in the wetlands. Uh, so, so that was successful. Um, and, you know, the water just kind of went into the, into the dry creek bread bed. Do you have anything to say? Sir? No, it, it would be nice to redirect some of the water from the roof down to there. We thought about it, but it really wasn't practical to do it. So we left it the way it was. Okay. I saw a couple of questions about the soil test. And um, Lois, maybe we'll start with you. And then Richard and Marianne, maybe we'll go to you about like, what was the garden like before? And, and tell us about the soil testing process and the outcome. And then we'll go on and see the next video of your garden. Ah, okay, dokie. So, uh... I always, at this point, get a soil test of the garden. It's not 100% proof because um, <laughs> the soil's not the same throughout every garden in every place. But um, I have found that it will show inadequacies in the soil that I can then um, bring in um, amendments. And I always use organic amendments and stuff. And I, br I bring them to a, a soil lab in Watsonville uh, called Perry Labs. It's expensive, but it's really worth it. Um, I, I showed the evergreen um, ribes, but there's also the, um, the coffee berries were just so small and stunted basically and, and yellow. And then they are, I hope you come to see the garden in person because they are just absolutely flourishing dense green and pig. And um, so it, it's been really, uh, it's really been well worth it. I think it's a very different garden now than what you see in the video. And partly because of the soil testing and the amendments, things that were just struggling for years now have really come to life and are really flourishing. So it's a, it's a very different look than what you saw in the video. I think this video was made last fall, wasn't it, Lois? Like about October or so? Right, right. So it, the garden had only been in for less than a year. I saw it in more spring, but it was just more full. And I'm sure it's much more full now than in the video. Oh, it is flourishing right now. Yes. Um, the poppies are out, the buttercups are out, the um, blue-eyed grass is blooming, and uh, the tidy tips are about to come. And the um, the sage is budding up really beautifully. And uh, what else? Uh, and the poppies. Yes, the poppies. <laughs> <laughs> and the um, uh, the arrows uh, budding up. And uh, is the uh, is the buckwheat budding up right now? Uh, I'm not sure. No, not yet. That'll be later. Mm -hmm. But what we have is um, Lois cleverly split this presentation into two so we could show you part of the garden and have a chance for discussion. We're going to go now and see a video on the second part of the garden. Hello, my name is Lois Simons, and I'm the owner of Gardening by Nature's Design. This garden here in the Lakeshore District is Marianne and Richard's garden. When I first came to this garden, there was no stone on this side of the garden other than the few couple of stones that were bordering the entryway. And to create a balance and a connection between one side of the garden to the other, uh, we put in a wall. Also because uh, there was a height differential. There was quite a slope here, and we wanted to mitigate that slope and, um, and create more um, moderate slope, more level land. So we put in this 
stone wall bed. It is also made of we utilizing the same stone that was used over there. It's a river rock stone. And because of its nature, um, we kind of played that out. And because we wanted a natural looking wall, not an architectural wall, we allowed it to curve and move throughout the garden. And the other thing is we really accentuated, almost like flying fish, the shape of the stones, rather than fitting them tightly together, we allowed them to flow one over the other, kind of falling into place as stone naturally would. And you see that? It's like a dolphin cresting a wave. There were several coffee berries here, and this, this here is a coffee berry. It had a, just a, maybe half a dozen, a dozen leaves on it. It was pretty paltry. Once again, we did these with the soil test, and we amended the soil. And as you can see, it has recovered and is flourishing. The same is true of the other coffee berries. This was really sparse and meager, and uh, they were yellow. So I just want to point out, and you can see there's lots of bees and wasps in this garden. Marianne has noticed how much more um, life there is in this garden, how many more birds are visiting this garden, insects, um, and I will show you later, we've had butterflies, and so it's not static, it's a dynamic ecosystem here that we're beginning to create. Perhaps just the beginnings, the basics of it, but it does have the, enough coherence to bring in wildlife, raccoons, deer, squirrels, and, um, and the things, the pollinators. This is, I mentioned the sunset manzanita or arctostaphylus before. This is it at a further stage. We have flowering plants in front of the wall. This is the pensamen, Heterophilus margarita BOP, and it borders both sides of the walkway. You'll no notice, here are the stakes that we used to protect initially plants from the deer. And we kept these here because we are also protecting this particular one from dogs. <laughs> This is a buckwheat, and here is a monkey flower. I use the um, Mimulus or Diplicus uh, orientiacus um, varieties. This is the changeling, um, one of my favorites. And here is a buckwheat and another monkey flower. So we create a pattern language here. We have the monkey flowers here, there and then around the bend and then in between we have the buckwheat. We also wanted to create some kind of connection and fluidity between the upper bed and the lower bed so we have the grasses here that feed into a grass below. It's a smaller area so we have a smaller grass here. This is the eyelash grass, Butilea, and I'm just going to point out an eyelash. This will be covered in eyelashes. It is fantastic and just so playful and fun. So you can see how the grasses flow from the upper bed down and will flow to the lower bed. This buckwheat has come uh, along a, a lot. It's uh, much bigger and you can see it's, it's budding out. We broke this up with a fuchsia, California fuchsia. And we have here the um, yarrow, Achillea millefolium, and this is the red flame. I find it to be a particularly strong yarrow, and we have it here in the upper bed and lower bed, once again creating the connection. This Dara's Choice salvia will fill the upper part of the bed, the backdrop here and it makes a nice
counterpoint to the emerald carpet in front. We have a new one here, so it's going to fill this entire bed. A back bed, I should say. This is another salvia. Uh, it's a whirly blue, and uh, it has beautiful purple flowers that come in swirls, as you can begin to see. And we're hoping it will fill, it's intended to fill this entire area here. Behind it is a uh, an Arctic staff list, and you can see um, from just the few Arctic staff lists that I have pointed out, these manzanitas are very diverse. Some are flat ground covers, some are uh, curving, sweeping ground covers, some get high, some remain low, and some are shrubs and trees. S some lose their lower leaves, some retain them. This is a Louis Edmund and it's a tree, a uh, shrub, and it comes to about six feet. So it will come up to the, just the, above the bottom of this window. And we're going to set, uh, lightly espalier it. And so it will define this breakfast nook space. It is also mirrored by this Arctostasvus Louis Edmund, and which is also positioned to mirror the other one. And it will also spread in similar fashion this way, so that there will be a correlation and mirroring between the two and a connection between the two beds. In this bed, we used grasses and um, primarily grasses, some uh, manzanitas as well, to create a pattern. And once we had that pattern set, this spring we planted the um, annual pollinating plants to extend the pollinating season. See grasses, remember the continuity between the upper and lower levels in the main bed. But we're going from grass over to grass. And we're continuing following the grasses throughout this uh, street side garden. It was wonderful to have such a wide bed street side that we could develop like this. We're utilizing the grasses to set up a pattern throughout the bed as well as the manzanitas. And then within that pattern um, are the pollinators, the gold bud, Solidago californica, Tidy Tips, Amaria, and this is another grass which I will show you. Um, this is the Calamagrostis foliosa. It's a really pretty grass. Several poppies, and the Tidy Tips once again, and more poppies. And here we come upon the California fescue that is in the main bed, along with the carrots that are in the main bed. And right before this uh, grass on either side of it is the milkweed. And that attracts um, the caterpillar for the monarch butterfly. So I planted the milkweed closely together three of them and so I have discovered uh, with the milkweed in terms of drawing the caterpillars and the butterflies that it's best to plant them uh, together close together rather than one here and one very far apart and that it has been more much more successful in drawing in the caterpillars and it was wonderful watching them crawl throughout the garden but what it made me realize is that while they feed on the milkweed they don't cocoon on the milkweed. And it's just as important, not simply to provide milkweed for the caterpillars, but to provide plants for the cocoon, for the ca caterpillar to cocoon. And that plant has to have a strong leaf with a nice arch to it so that it can tolerate and accept the weight of that cocoon. And so um, the coffee berries are a good example of that. They uh, are able to cocoon uh, in the coffee berries. 
there are other plants as well. But um, that's something that um, is important to incorporate in your garden if you're thinking of bringing in the caterpillars for the monarch butterfly or any other butterfly for that matter. Okie dokie. We also have here um, buttercups, California ranuncula. And um, throughout the garden are the blue-eyed grass. Uh, you see it in the backdrop here and stuff. And we're allowing it to be slightly wild and then we will thin it out. And uh, as we've done before, we've, we've potted a great deal of them and uh, give them to people for restoration or for their own gardens. We have the coyote bush pigeon point here and we continue it in the street side, once again, uniting the bed. And here we have the Calamagrosis foliosa, a little more mature, and stuff with this seedling to give you a sense of um, its form. So it was really important, this second stage of planting, to extend um, the pollinator plants for pollinators to be able to come and, and make use of this garden. So we're extending the season, and uh, it's been a joy to do so. We're running out of time, so I just like to take a, a quick uh, visit over to uh, Richard and Mary Ann. And if you could tell us, like, what do you really enjoy about the garden? <laughs> you go first. Um, I don't know. I haven't, I mean, there's lots of elements that I like. Um, uh, it was, there's different departments. The, the way the sun hits the property is that by the parking strip, it's a whole different uh, climate than back toward the house. And so we have different kind of um, areas where this, by the house it's ferns and other things and native ferns and then um, more sun loving plants in the front. Um, well, I love the fact that there's always something going on. I mean, we have lots of birds. We had last year, we had lots of monarchs and it was really a lot of and then I went on I, I said oh my gosh look at all these aphids on the monarchs and I sort of went on a, an aphid jihad but um you know I shouldn't have worried um I just like I like working in the garden I like being out there um and what Lois did with the the um I don't know if people remember but the very first slide in Lois's presentation was what the house looked like when we bought it so someone in the in the uh, chat made a, a comment about in the 50s and 60s, it used to be just, you know, sort of flat yards. Um, ours was worse. Um, the previous owners had put down black, impermeable black plastic and covered it with small river rock right up to the trunk of the, the cedar tree. So the cedar tree was withering and getting rid of that river rock, one of Richard's um, that was one of the reasons for the stream bed in the in the first place was to use up some of the river rock. But uh, we're still getting rid of River Walk. Well, it's a beautiful garden. So I have to push on now, but I want to say that there are a lot of questions in the chat if you have time, Lois and um, Marianne and Richard, to respond to them. I'm going to take care of a couple of them now. So, yes, the soil testing was done through Perry Labs. Yes, they do tell you what quantities and what materials to put on. Um, I used Perry Labs myself after hearing about the soil testing from Lois and, and Marianne. I'd never tested my soil before, but I did, and it really improved my front garden, which was a newly planted garden after a big construction project, and the plants were doing, a year later, they even were retracted from when they were put in the ground. They just looked worse than when we had initially got them. They hadn't grown, and my husband and I are really amazed at, you know, how much better the plants are doing now. When I do um, put in a request and I send in the soil, I let them know what kind of plants I'm planting, California natives and that I want organic recommendations. 
Otherwise, they'll give you chemical. Yeah, you do get a choice if you want organic or conventional. And I also chose the organic recommendations. So I'm going to have to push on now. If you guys can uh, respond to questions in the chat, that would be great. Otherwise, I hope that um, visitors, viewers can go visit this garden on Saturday, May the 6th in Oakland. So Lois, thank you so much. Marianna, Richard, thank, thank you. you for joining us. We're going to hear for, uh, for a moment from the uh, Clean Water Program, Alameda County. So you may know already, or you may not, that water from rainstorms that enters the storm drain system carries pollutants that can harm creeks in the bay. If you use pesticides in your yard and then you water them in, they wash off, they flow down the street into the storm drain, into creeks, killing fish and wildlife on the way and into the bay. So um, eliminating pesticide use is a great thing that you can do for the environment and keeping the rainwater that falls on your property on site is another great thing that you can do. We'll hear now from uh, our sponsor, the Clean Water Program in Alameda County. Water runs off our buildings, driveways, and sidewalks. It runs off our yards and gardens. It runs down the street and into the storm drains, carrying pesticides, litter, soap, and motor oil. Then it flows into creeks in the bay. You can prevent this pollution by using less toxic garden products and washing your car at a car wash instead of the driveway. Only rain should go down the storm drain. Learn more at cleanwaterprogram.org. If you are watching today and haven't had a chance yet to make a donation, if you'll please support the tour. You can do it on the tour's uh, website under Please Donate. You can Venmo a contribution to at Bringing Back the Natives. We depend upon donations to keep going, and we hope that if you've enjoyed our presentation, that you will help us to keep this event going.